Blessed be God forever. Good day. My name is Slimer Benedict de Masuhid, the first reporter of Group 6. Helen Keller once said, I am just as deaf as I am blind. The problems of deafness are deeper and more complex, if not more important than those of blindness. Deafness is much worse misfortune, for it means the loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, set thoughts astir, and keeps us in the intellectual company of men. Hearing Made possible through the collection of sound waves, changed to vibrations, and conducted as impulses to the brain. Hearing refers to the reception of sound by the ear, its analysis, and its transmission to the brain. An impairment is any loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical structure or function. Now, let us proceed to the parts of the ear. There are three major parts of the ear, the external ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear is responsible for collecting conducting sound waves. The middle ear is the closed chamber behind the eardrum that transmits sound vibrations to the inner ear. And lastly, the inner ear. It contains sound receptors in the form of microscopic hair cells that are bathed in fluid. Movement of the ossicles stimulates the hair cells, which in turn activate the hearing nerve endings that send an electrical impulse to the brain. How we hear. First, sound waves enter your outer ear and travel through the ear canal to your eardrum. Second, your eardrum vibrates with the incoming sound and sends the vibration to three tiny bones in your middle ear. Third, the bones in your middle ear amplify the sound vibrations and send them in your inner ear or cochlea. The sound vibrations activate tiny hair cells in the inner ear, which in turn release neurochemical messengers. And lastly, your auditory nerve carries this electrical signal to the brain, which translates it into a sound you can understand. Now let us move to the different types of hearing loss or also known as hearing impairment. First is the conductive hearing impairment. A conductive loss refers to a decrease in sound caused by a problem in the outer or middle ear. It occurs when sound waves do not reach the inner ear. Second is the sensory neural hearing impairment. A sensory neural loss refers to a problem located in the inner ear and along the nerve pathway between the inner ear and the brain. It occurs when sound waves are not processed correctly. The third one is the auditory neuropathy. A problem with the auditory nerve transmitting the signal from the cochlea to the brain. And the last one is the mixed hearing impairment, which is from the word itself mixed. It is a mixed loss, refers to a conductive loss and a sensory neural loss occurring at the same time. So see the illustration for better understanding. Next slide is how hearing impairment occurs. Its causes are first, a gradual buildup of earwax. Second is ear infection and abnormal bone growth or tumors. Ruptured eardrum can also be a cause and last is damage to the inner ear. So the next slide shows the uh, illustration of how hearing impairment occurs. Characteristic of persons with hearing impairment. First is muffling of speech and other sound. The other term for muffling is keeping down or suppress. Difficulty understanding words. 
especially against background noise and a crowd of people. Frequently asking others to speak more slowly, clearly, and loudly. Needing to turn up the volume of the television or radio. Withdrawal from conversations and avoidance of some social settings. Common causes of hearing loss is a partial or total inability to hear sounds. For me, we are born to have an ability where we have this skill or talent or such as things that we actually can do and disability such as things that a person actually can do. And now, going back to the topic, I will be discussing about the common causes of hearing loss. The first is congenital. The hearing impairment is already present at birth. It is said that the hearing disability is inborn, which is when we're developing in the womb of our mother, the hearing impairment is also developing. The second one is jaundice. Jaundice is the lack of oxygen at birth, which is a severe condition that needs a blood transfusion, where this blood transfusion could also result in hearing loss. Jaundice is also a potential damage that high levels of bilirubin that can also cause the nerves of hearing wear. Bilirubin is a yellow-orange bile pigment and is formed from the breakdown of red blood cells that would also cause a child suffering from breathing, which is the lack of oxygen. The third one is genetic. Genetic is a condition of being inherited or sometimes called heredity. If a person has a hearing disability, this person's blood-related might also get the condition of hearing disability. Middle ear infection, or sometimes called acute otitis media. It is an infection in the ear where it occurs when a virus or bacteria causes the area behind the eardrum to become inflamed. Illnesses. Illnesses can also be the reason why a person develops hearing loss. These illnesses can be exampled as mumps, where the initial symptoms are non-specific. The second one is rubella which is a contagious viral infection that may cause mild symptoms such as this hearing impairment. Next is aging. As we grow older, we should be prepared for the symptoms or conditions that may cause or may cure. As I have known, these conditions occur when we have a low immune system. Next is major infections. Infections affect hearing loss, which also affects the nerves of hearing. The next one is exposure to any sort of chemicals, or sometimes called autotoxicants. It may cause of hearing loss or balance problems. The risk of hearing loss is increased when a person is exposed to any sort of chemicals when doing something or working around that includes elevating loud noises. The next is head injury or trauma or traumatic brain injuries. It can result in a variety of problems related to the ear including hearing loss, dizziness, vertigo, and tinnitus that may cause damage to the auditory pathway. The degrees of hearing loss. There are four types of degrees of hearing loss which is mild, moderate, severe, and profound. The first one is mild. It is a difficulty soft-spoken person where a person may hear, may hear speech sound but difficulty hearing soft sounds. The second one is moderate. It is a difficulty hearing a vowel sounds and missing consonant sounds, which a person may struggle in hearing and understanding speeches when someone is talking normally. The third one is severe, which is the speech is inaudible and without hearing aids or cochlear implant, will only hear little to no speech when spoken to normal levels and hear only loud sounds. The fourth one is profound. The very loud sounds such as airplane engines, fire alarms, are can, cannot be heard without hearing aids. And when they use hearing aids, loud sounds may be heard but not speeches. The next slide is the data of levels of hearing. As you can see, there are six levels of hearing sounds. The hearing loss range depends 
on what levels of hearing does a person have. The informal hearing assessment process. The goal of informal hearing process is to develop an idea of how the child uses his or her hearing in various environments across the course of the day and try to discover what variables support the best use of hearing in order to continuously improve the use of hearing. During the process, observation will be used to determine what if any sounds the child seems to react to and what if any meaning the child is getting from auditory information. Observation, of course, is also supported with information from formal hearing tests. Observation also includes setting up situations and seeing how the child responds. Steps during the process Step 1. General functioning The first step of informal hearing assessment is getting an idea of the general functioning of the child. Does the child show any awareness of any sensory information such as visual, tactile, or etc.? How does the child show that awareness? What motor behavior seems to indicate that the child was aware of and responding to sensory information? Without this information, you can tease out hearing from other factors. Good questions to ask at this point are what does the child do with sensory information? Has the child learned or can she learn to associate movement cues with a pleasurable activity? Does the child show anticipation of an event from seeing or touching an object? Step 2. Responses to auditory information. Now you can ask. Does the child show anticipation or recognition through the use of hearing? That is, does a child anticipate an event when they only hear a sound associated with that event before they see or touch something associated with the event? What sounds does a child respond to? Step 3. Looking for patterns. At this point, we are looking for patterns of responses. We are trying to find out which sounds under what conditions give the best. Easiest to see? most consistent, meaningful to the child responses. Number one, is there a difference in performance based on the types of sounds? Slow pitch versus high pitch, onset versus cessation, simple versus complex, for example, one instrument versus orchestra, rhythms, loud versus soft, long versus short duration. Number two, are there any clear preferences such as people's voices, male, female, young, old, familiar, unfamiliar, types of music, musical instruments, and objects? Number three, is there a difference in performance in different environments such as quiet versus noisy, echo, Competing or supporting information from other senses. Number four. Is there a difference in performance depending on where the sound came from? Such as in front, behind, right, left, above, and below. Number five. How long after the input does it take for a typical response to occur? Number six. Do responses vary, such as across different environments, such as indoors, outdoors, hallways, carpeted room, tall rooms, etc., at different times of day, before or after meal time, before or after receiving medication, with the physical position of the child? Natural observation, doing nothing but watching the child, might not give you all the information you need at this point. Using information from formal hearing tests, you might want to set up some situations to help you observe patterns. For example, the results of formal hearing tests may indicate that the child should be able to hear loud low-frequency sounds like a drum beat. 
You then might want to set up a simple turn-taking game involving the beating of a drum to see if the child will listen while you beat the drum, then take a turn and beat the drum after you stop. If the child can do this, then you might want to try similar games with other sounds that vary by pitch and loudness to see what sounds the child can use and which he or she can't. Of course, it may take several repetitions of the game, across several days or week, before the child learns their role. Step 4. What does it mean to the child? The next step is to ask, how does the child use auditory information? At a reflexive awareness level, does the child startle to sound but otherwise not pay much attention? At a regulating level, does the does sound help the child enter and maintain a quiet and alert biobehavioral state? Are there sounds that send the child into a fussy, agitated state? At a motor level, does the child turn towards or reach for an object or person making a sound, even if the child can't see or touch the sound source? At the play level, does the child enjoy making noise? either with his or her mouth, by activating switches, hitting two objects together, playing musical instrument at an associative level. Does the child associate a particular sound with a particular event? At a communication level, does the child recognize any common words, especially his or her name? Does the child try to use any sounds consistently to communicate? Step 5. Where do we go from here? Gathering this information over time can help guide programming for the child. Information from steps 1 to 4 should give an emerging picture of what is meaningful to the child. This information should guide our next steps, that is, how do we help the child use a greater and a greater variety of auditory information in more and more situations and with better precision and in more and more sophisticated ways. Informal information should be shared with audiologists to help them in the process of deciding how well a hearing aid or cochlear implant is meeting the needs of a particular child and if adjustments need to be made. Information from the informal hearing assessment process can also help guide the formal hearing assessment process by letting the audiologist know typical kinds of responses a particular child might make to various kinds of auditory input. Common disorder associated with hearing loss first is fistula, a hole or rupture of the oval or round window in the inner ear may link perilymph into the middle ear. Next, meningitis, neonatal infection which serves as common cause of acquired sensory linear hearing loss. Usher syndrome, autosomal recessive disorder which occurs in 6 to 12 percent of congenitally deaf children and 3 in 100,000 of the general population. Lyme disease, Acquired disorder caused by tick borne spirochet. So that's all and thank you.